and who has more than five messaging apps on their mobile devices, and who has more than 10 messaging apps on their mobile devices. Okay. Um, so you see there is uh, a huge potential to talk about and today we have Carla Guicho here and she is talking about the dilemma of walled gardens and all the messaging uh, apps and ecosystem um, and give her a warm welcome and uh, carefully listen to what she is telling us about insights from the user perspective. Well, thank you everyone for being here and thanks again for the introduction. Um, my name is Carla Grigio and I'm a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Aalborg in Denmark where I do research on human computer interaction and more specifically on computer mediated communication. This means again that this, to this talk is going to be about people. And uh, these research fields, um, just to contextualize the talk, are concerned with understanding how people interact with technology and how we can design technology so that it's easier to use, easier to learn, and that it actually responds to user needs. And in particular, uh, CMC uh, contextualizes these questions in communication software. Uh, so to do research about these things, we do empirical studies such as interviews and experiments and online surveys. We can build and deploy new communication technologies to see how these affect uh, users in a new way. Uh, but more importantly, ultimately, we want to develop new theoretical concepts that can help us, th help us think about these things so that they provide new vocabulary to understand why people behave the way that they do and how that can inform new ways of designing communication apps. So a research question that has been driving all the studies that, I, that, I, that I've been doing in the last years is why do users communicate via ecosystems of messaging apps instead of only one? And when I talk about ecosystems of messaging apps, I'm, I'm not talking about all the apps that are available out there in the App Store. I'm talking about the personal collections that individuals craft for themselves in their devices. And by asking this question, we just have to acknowledge that um, perhaps designing for communication is not so much about thinking of what's that one messaging app to rule them all, but more about um, how are people communicating via these collections of messaging apps and how we can design for that. So one of the first questions that um, I investigated with uh, colleagues in France um, many years ago was what motivates people to use multiple messaging apps uh, in an interview study. And we saw that many participants liked separating contacts in different apps, creating what we called a communication place on top of each of those apps. And this concept of a communication place is really a personal construct that users associate to an app and refers to a very personal definition of what that app should be used for, how that app feels like, and who should be allowed to be a contact in the app and who should stay outside of it and far away from it. For example, this is a quote uh, by a participant. In my head, WhatsApp is low and old. I only use it for groups like the family WhatsApp group. So to talk to my friend there is weird. Whereas Messenger is white and happy and empty. It feels way more airy and I use it for all my friends. And it's important to know here that this is what one participant uh, felt like, uh, but other participants had exactly the opposite thoughts about WhatsApp and Messenger. Um, so uh, to show you more examples, we saw that uh, one participant told us that WhatsApp used to be his place for sending funny voice messages with a group of friends. 
Um, but at some point, WhatsApp started to become very popular, and he started to have a lot of other contacts in WhatsApp. So he felt that this group of friends uh, sort of drowned out, and they decided to move to Snapchat to have it as the new place for, for just being funny. Uh, so instead of sending uh, funny voice messages, now they send to each other funny videos. Um, and it's interesting here how um, this, this idea of moving people to now an exclusive messaging app gives this sense of a cozy place. And uh, it comes with some advantages. If I receive a notification from Snapchat, I already know who's it coming from. So it gives me more control over uh, whether I should just run to look at the message or leave it for later. We also saw participants breaking the rules that they created around their communication places, especially when the functionality that they needed for a conversation was in a different app. So a common example uh, happened between Tinder and other messaging apps. We had a participant um, that moved a contact, a contact from Tinder to WhatsApp to have access to richer functionality. Uh, Tinder, for example, doesn't have like reactions or uh, allows you to send pictures, but things didn't work out with this person. So um, uh, they started avoiding WhatsApp altogether just to avoid showing that they were online because just deleting a contact is too rude. Um, and this made the participant miss out on other conversations, for example, conversations with their family. Um, so the interesting thing here is that we typically see walled gardens, the silos that apps are a bit like as a bad thing because um, they don't allow us to communicate with whom we want to communicate. We need to go and install new apps just because they, they prefer something else. Um, but these stories show that the participants liked uh, communicating via wall gardens because uh, they found ways of repurposing them as ways to enforce in social boundaries and keeping separate aspects of their life separate. However, in another study, uh, I looked further into how the walls between apps do hurt personal expression. Um, participants described many situations, as I was saying before, where they missed the functionality that they had in other apps, for example, the stickers, the emojis, or some other functionality. Um, and this was very frustrating because they, they felt that they couldn't express the way they wanted with the person they were having a conversation with. Uh, this is what um, I call an expression breakdown. And why is it a breakdown? Because it forces users to stop focusing on the conversation that they're having and start focusing on the internals of the technology that they're using. Um, so to show you how important these expression breakdowns uh, were, let me show you the workarounds that they found uh, to, to get away with expressing themselves the way they wanted. Uh, this participant um, was having a conversation in WhatsApp but wanted to use this sticker that was only available on Messenger. So he went to Messenger, sent the sticker, the sticker to someone else, took a screenshot, went back to WhatsApp, and sent the sticker as a picture in the conversation he wanted to. And there was another participant um, that wanted to decorate a picture with emojis of uh, him and a friend that didn't use Snapchat anymore. Um, so he went to Snapchat, decorated the picture with the emojis, downloaded the picture, then went to Instagram and sent it there. So these studies are showing a very interesting tension from a user perspective between the advantages and disadvantages of World Gardens. If we look at World Gardens as an encapsulation of contacts and functionality, we can think that the walls between the contacts of the different apps are what are enabling the creation of communication places and this sort of privacy preserving uh, strategy of keeping separate aspects of my life separate. But on the other hand, the same walls are between the functionality of these apps, which causes expression breakdowns when I can't use the functionality I need with the people I want. 
Which, which brings me to the wall garden dilemma. The walls between apps serve as a privacy-preserving tool for drawing social boundaries between contacts, but also restrict how we can communicate with whom. And this is why it's so hard to choose between apps, and we keep having them, uh, having more and more. Um, but now that we know this, uh, we can see this contradiction as a resource for design. And we can ask ourselves how we can design new communication tools that let users preserve their communication places while preventing expression breakdowns. And here is where you might think, ah, she's finally talking about matrix and how interoper interoperability is coming to solve it all. But no, not yet. Um, <laughs> I uh, first want to show you a different idea that I've been exploring. So um, if we think of interoperability and what the DMA wants to achieve, uh, we would be thinking about bringing the contacts of other wall gardens to the app that I like using. So I can bring the contacts to the functionality that I'm used to and that I like. What if instead we brought the functionality that I like to the other apps. So um, to explore this question, um, I designed and developed Dearboard. Dearboard is a mobile keyboard that includes a new type of functionality that I call co-customizations. So co-customizations are customizations that uh, both users in a conversation can see and also modify. Uh, the co-customizations included in Dearboard are a color theme uh, where you can change the, the background color and the color of the keys, and also shortcuts to emojis and GIFs. And um, if, let's say, Alice uh, makes a modification to the shortcuts on, on Dearboard, then Bob is going to see uh, the, same, the same customization and he can change them back. <coughs> So the, the inside, the design inside here is that by adding this new functionality in the keyboard, we are using the keyboard as a Trojan horse to bring communication, uh, communication tools that belong to the user to any of the communication apps that they already have. And in that way, we allow them to preserve their communication places as they are, adding new functionality that they don't need to compromise on. Uh, so uh, we preserve communication places while also avoiding new expression breakdowns. But I'm going to leave this idea floating in your heads as an alternative to the, to the path of uh, interoperability. And I'm coming back to wall gardens. So now you're thinking, sure, Carla, Wall gardens enable communication places, that's nice. But they also create huge network effects that lead to tech monopolies and less freedom of choice. And we don't like that. I don't like it either. Uh, so now I would like to discuss how the concepts of communication places and expression breakdowns are relevant to breaking network effects. Remember uh, a couple of years ago when WhatsApp updated their privacy policy? So what happened was that suddenly every WhatsApp user got this uh, screen on their phones and uh, at the bottom it said, by tapping agree, you accept the new terms and privacy policy which take effect on this date. After this date, you'll need to accept the terms to continue using WhatsApp. It was a scandal and um, the privacy was making more transparent uh, what kind of data WhatsApp was sharing with Meta. Um, and we started seeing on the news media all these, these articles saying millions flee to Signal and Telegram. Signal is meteoric rise in daily installs. Um, and it gave us a sense of, uh, okay, everybody is leaving WhatsApp. Uh, it's, it's happening. Uh, something finally happened that is breaking network effects. Um, so we ran a survey with uh, about 500 WhatsApp users to really see um, what was going on here. Um, what we found was that about 26% of the participants in the survey wanted to switch at least partially to other apps, but only 6% of um, overall a quarter of a quarter of participants managed to switch as much as they wanted. 
and only 0.5%, eight participants actually uninstalled WhatsApp. So this was a big eye-opener because uh, what looked like a huge, great migration of messaging apps wasn't really the case. Uh, so it's very interesting to understand what happened there and why uh, in, in such a huge event, network eff effects were still so strong. So uh, we looked into uh, how many apps participants were using. Uh, they were using a medium of five apps already, um, four apps they used regularly, and they used one primary app very frequently. For 78% of the participants, that app was WhatsApp. Um, we also looked into whether users installed or uh, started using more often uh, apps that they already had. And, and this is what we saw. Uh, it might be particularly uh, eye-catching um, that the two apps that did see more installs were in fact Signal and Telegram, but there were a lot of people that already had Telegram and decided to use it more often. Um, and it's important to think that the participants that managed to switch actually ended up switching to the median of three alternative apps, not one. Um, looking into what were the barriers to moving to other apps, um, I uh, collected some of the um, uh, quotes and explanations that people gave about why it was hard to switch to, to leave WhatsApp. So a lot of, uh, most of the reasons had to do with network effects. We, we, we see people saying, having friends and family still stuck with WhatsApp is a challenge because I need to convince them to change. And some people don't want to move because nobody else uses it. Um, or things like, my job requires me to use WhatsApp as part of work, work groups, and uh, other people didn't want to leave the groups that they already had in WhatsApp that were very integrated to their social uh, life and different uh, social circles. So here we start seeing that there is some social pressure into preserving these communication places. It's like, we already agreed that, that this is where our communication happens and this is the way it happens. Um, we also saw many, um, many explanations that I relate more to um, expression breakdowns. So when, when uh, these users were trying to uh, switch from WhatsApp to other apps, they suddenly faced uh, that there are no other apps that do the same thing, uh, or they, the, the other apps lack the customizations that they liked, uh, no stories in apps like Telegram, um, or uh, that, that just learning a new design was something challenging. Uh, we also saw only 5%, 5% of the answers related to privacy concerns, which is quite ironic, right? Um, since everybody was fleeing WhatsApp because they were scared of WhatsApp sharing data with, with other people. Uh, and some of the challenges were that, uh, I mean, reading through the terms and conditions of the new apps was very time consuming. Um, and this is very interesting too. When you install a new app for the first time, probably you haven't installed a new messaging app, app for years. You forget that when you install a new app, you need to uh, like allow for permissions to access uh, contacts, to access uh, pictures, etc. Um, but maybe they, they thought that only the new app was doing this, which gave them privacy concerns. And maybe said, oh, no, they, they, they want all this data, maybe I, I, I stick with WhatsApp. Um, and last, uh, and, and this, I find this quite important, um, there was a feeling of a loss of control over where to communicate with whom, because everybody was trying to flee at the same time. Uh, so we saw comments saying, for example, it was difficult to know that other contacts were using the new app. Uh, trying to maintain conversations in different apps can be confusing, and messaging a, f a friend using SMS, <laughs> but then they respond over, over WhatsApp. So it's very, re really hard to break people's communication habits when, when they don't have the same motivation as you do. Um, last about this, um, I wanted to just point out some ironic, more ironic things. Um, as I mentioned before, most of the users switch to Signal and Telegram, uh, but it's a bit, Curious that 
if they were concerned about privacy, why they would move to Telegram where conversations are not end-to-end -end encrypted by default. And what's even funnier is that a third of the people trying to leave WhatsApp went to Messenger and Instagram, which are also owned by Meta. And at least back then, it explicitly said in the privacy policies that they were able to access their conversations for improving products or whatever. Um, thinking that SMS is secure, is, uh, we, we know that, uh, about this misconception, but uh, we also saw it here. Uh, the data set is available if you want to run your own stats about this data, if you want to play with it. Um, so, going back to this walled garden dilemma. Um, considering what we learned about communication places and expression breakdowns, now we can ask, how should we design for messaging interoperability so that users keep control over their social boundaries and also avoid expression breakdowns? And uh, here I'm going to discuss three reflections that I have about it, but I think we, 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 we could talk uh, for ages about this, and I'm very interested uh, to, to know what you think about it uh, later on. Uh, first, I think that in an interoperable world, users should still have control over their social boundaries. So interoperability could let users chat where they want, with whom they want, in theory, uh, and forming this ideal uh, um, conception of a communication place, but it could also take away their control over who's allowed in an app and who should stay outside. So, um, a few days ago, um, Meta published an update on how they are designing um, the, the third-party app uh, functionality, and Matthew also uh, talked about it a little bit uh, during the opening keynote. So the question is, should third-party chats be enabled by default? It's a very valid, complex question. So if they were enabled by default, of course, this could raise awareness, help raise awareness about um, uh, interoperable chats now being a thing and now being available. Uh, it could uh, increase visibility of other apps trying to interoperate, for example, Element. But I think it's important to consider that it could also disrupt users' communication places, causing a negative association between interoperability and this sense of lack of control over where I communicate with whom. Um, so another question is, should third-party chats be enabled by, by uh, no, sorry, uh, on, on this question too, uh, you could think, okay, maybe they can receive a message request first, um, and then they, can, they are in control about where to communicate with whom. Yeah, but you put them into this awkward position of having to say no and being rude and having to come up with excuses uh, about like, yeah, I don't really want to chat with you and WhatsApp and I have my reasons. But, um, so it's, it's important to remember this, this uh, social aspect of, of uh, human relationships. Um, also, should third party chats and local chats be combined or separated? Well, it depends. Um, it depends on who are the people in the other app and the relationships of the user with those people. Um, could maybe some contacts be combined and some separate instead of making that separation dependent on the app? Uh, or will functionality such as status indicators apply the same for local chats and, and third-party chats, or will users have a, a way of controlling what functionality they share with whom? Uh, second, interoperability protocol specs should minimize expression breakdowns. Just to be quick, I think that the DMA right now um, is saying that this is the, the functionality that should be interoperable. Um, but based on what I've been discussing, uh, I think that this is too little to actually break network effects. Um, so um, Meta is considering to add in these functionalities, but it's still not very clear if this is enough. Why? Because users want privacy and security, yes, but not at the cost of their established communication habits. And this is the last takeaway that, that, I, that I want to share with you um, for all of you who are designing uh, new communication apps. Um, so 
let's remember that the main purpose of a communication app is to communicate. So lack of support for these existing habits may pose great barriers to adoption. And uh, a trivial but really important example, I think, are stickers. Um, stickers are a feature that uh, are, uh, is available in many apps, but for example in WhatsApp, they are very personal. Uh, users can create their own single sticker, share it, they become family memes, or uh, they have a special meaning with a special group of friends. They represent culture. So if they can't express themselves uh, in the same way that their stickers, their personal collection of stickers allow, um, they might still prefer to stick with the app where those stickers are. So, to conclude, will the Digital Markets Act effectively counter network effects? Well, hopefully, but if users lose control over where to communicate with whom, and if the interoperable protocols are too restrictive in, in terms of the expression that they allow, I think we risk seeing very little change. So. Uh, Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward for discussions. Thank you very much. There was a question from the internet. Um, someone was asking, um, in the example you gave was the keyboard. Mm -hmm. If you push UI settings into the room, how to deal with accessibility issues uh, of, from the receiver? Do you have a suggestion here? Ah, uh, it's a shame that I actually skipped um, a slide where we also repurposed this idea of uh, a keyboard for improving accessibility. Um, I don't completely follow the question, I think. Um, the question was, when you push Magenta to other users and they have the color problem, they kind of see ah. Sorry, yeah, sorry. So it makes a lot of sense. When you push Magenta, for example, to the other users for the keyboard, and they cannot work with it because they're colorblind. Yeah. Then it has some well, uh, of course, I, I mean, uh, the, the, the focus with the project wasn't accessibility. Uh, actually, if, if, you, if you go to my website, you, you can see how to use keyboards actually for improving accessibility across different messaging apps. Um, I would say that it would need some considerations into suggesting colors. And uh, it's a nice question because it brings me back to thinking of um, this, this different idea of associating functionality to people instead of apps. So if I know that I'm having a conversation with someone that needs better accessibility, perhaps the keyboard could adapt to, for example, show warnings about what colors to use or not. Um, or um, it could adapt the size of the emojis in the in the in the shortcut, or um, warn the, the the user with typical vision about the role of emojis in uh, understanding messages that are going to be interpreted by a screen reader. So uh, I think it's a very nice example of how to think of who am I talking to and what's the relevant functionality between these two people instead of to the app. Yeah. Thank you. And there's another question over there. I'm running. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Very uh, interesting subject. I think that uh, we as an industry collectively failed at addressing one specific problem of uh, people. They have the cognitive load to address. And uh, those like apps versus folders for different groups, it basically does not reduce, reduce the cognitive load enough. So people found a workaround by installing separate, separate apps to put them in the context of talking to the family, talking to the, to the, to, to the job, and, and so yeah. on. So it, it does not have to do with the with the walled gardens, in fact. It's just that people want these walled gardens for them, controlled by them. Yes, excellent point. Yes. <laughs> if we want to be controversial, we can say that the problem is not that there are walled gardens around apps. The problem is that the walled gardens are imposed and that yeah, we can't exactly. control them. Yeah. Uh, by artificial means, because these walled gardens are yes. like they're following not the rules that people want them to follow. Yes, yes, great 
great observation. Oh, okay. And um, so th through some of the talks uh, yesterday, for example, in the, um, there were some talks uh, about the infrastructure of element uh, to what was what was the name uh, the, the something gateway border. the secure border gateway yes so I was seeing this need of keeping separate concerns separate um, but so so we see a need to have our own uh, creations of world gardens so to say. Uh, and, and here, taking the stance of, um, of a user, not a company, uh, uh, thinking about personal communication, it would be nice to think about how these wall gardens could be flexible and malleable to, to give them more control about it. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you all.